Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. So before we get started, we always want to remind you of a few things that you'll find in our description and show notes every week. You will always find links to the resources that we use for research if you want to do some more looking into the cases that we talk about. You will also find links... At Metro, the best deal in wireless is on. Switch to Metro and get one full Amazon Prime membership included every month. Plus, get two free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens. All with two lines for just 90 bucks. That's the best deal in wireless, only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Offer subject to change. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Amazon Prime has a $12.99 per month value. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions. Thanks to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to follow us over there and check out when our new episodes are coming out and some memes and a bunch of stuff like that. You will also find the links to our Patreon and our Threadless. So on our Threadless, we have larger merch items like t-shirts and phone cases and stuff like that. And on Patreon, there's stickers, magnets, a bunch of stuff. Little things. Pins. You love love your pins. I do. (laughs) I get asked a lot, how can I get pins? Right? So if you want to get some of those, you can join our Patreon. And while we're on that subject, we have a few Patreon people that we wanted to thank this week. So I've been a little bit of a slacker. I owe everyone an apology because I haven't been on top of the Patreon and I haven't been shouting people out. So I have a list. I'm going to do like half of them this week, half of them next week. Cool? Sounds good. So we want to say thank you to the new Patreon supporters, Tamara, Brandy, Marsha, Ella, Sarah Emily, Amy, and Syrita increased her pledge. So thank you, you guys. Thank you. So with all that said, I think we can kind of get into our case for today. Yeah, I'm excited. So we're on a new letter. We're on letter B now, and we've decided it was Courtney's suggestion to do bikers. You just have everything in one place. Everything is in biker cases. Criminal enterprise just this is it it's crazy everything you could want and more yeah so they live and die by this (laughs) it really is an interesting sort of I don't know like whole separate society that you have to learn the rules of and yes I know the other day you text me and you're like oh my god the patches I'm so caught up in the patches I'm trying to learn all this stuff there's so many different rules that you just you don't even I've watched a ton of. of Gangland and I've seen every, you know, biker thing and all this stuff, but it it was still like, wait a second. Okay. I need a flow chart. Right. <laughs> for what club becomes what, to what chapter, to what city, to what mm-hmm. leader, to what master this, that president presides over, you know, this shit F F forever. And it was just wild. Yeah. I got a little bit into it, but then I decided to just focus on everything else in the story because I was like, I can't even get into, we're talking about the Hells Angels tonight, and that's way too big. I was like, let me just stay focused on the other aspects it of the story. It all spiderwebs from the Hells Angels too. Yes. Like most of They're it very early starts on and just goes pioneers. from Pioneers. Oh, yeah. So the first one we have is a pretty famous case. I know we were both kind of aware of it beforehand. It's the story of Altamont. I think most people are aware when they hear Altamont, it's like, oh, tragedy. Right. And if you know the story, you understand it. But I, I, there's probably a lot of people that don't necessarily know why or the details. Yeah, I think that some people know that there was a murder at Altamont and that's kind of where it ends. And the if Rolling you have, Stones. Yes. And that's it. Right. So we're going to get into the story and give you some background and some more information that maybe you wouldn't be familiar with. So... In mid-August 1969, Woodstock was attended by about 400,000 people, and it was about four times as big as the organizers had actually anticipated the show would be. In the months that followed Woodstock, basically the Rolling Stones figured that they had to put together their own Woodstock and kind of capitalize on the success of this fest. It was a great idea. I mean, if you're just a business person trying to make some money. They really try to put this on Mick Jagger, too, that it was like his specific idea. Right. Which, maybe. Maybe. But there's also a lot of managers behind when you read about this, like manager so-and-so for so-and-so. Right. They're all connected. 
there's all sorts of people behind these bands that helped organize this event. So it's not just Mick Jagger to blame. Keith but his Richards name is not calling venues. Right. <laughs> Trying to get security. For their free festival. Yeah, not at all. So they were trying to put together this show that was supposed to be sort of like this West Coast Woodstock with the Grateful Dead and a bunch of other kind of West Coast local bands. Very Bay Area, San Francisco. Yes, very much so. All of the sort of hate Ashbury bands. Jam bands. Yeah. Good stuff. They also wanted to turn the concert footage into a film just like Woodstock was planning to do. But they hoped that they could kind of rush together the movie and release it before the Woodstock movie so they could kind of steal some of its thunder. Genius. A genius and a dick move at the same time. Well, yeah, but I mean. It's just business, you I, know. But then so funny. I just have to point it out because it's it's a bunch of hippies that are like peace, love, blah, blah, blah. But really, they're business people. They want money. They're rock stars. That's it. A lot of the people that were in this hippie movement just looked around and said, I can exploit the shit out of these people and they will pay me. Exactly. But all the audience members are just like, yeah, free love. Yes. But the people behind it were actually just like, give me your money. The opportunists too, like Jim's jo- Jim Jones and People's Temple are in San Francisco at right. this point. Exactly. And they're just preying at, on all these people that we're talking about right now. A lot of these people are attending People's Temple services right now in san francisco and they're just praying there's certain people that were just preying on a lot of these followers and these hippie movements the first proposed venue for the show was sears point in sonoma which is near san francisco if you're not from california sonoma is kind of famously like wine country yes absolutely wine tasting anyone from la knows that as wine country but i don't know if other people not from the area would know i don't know either but when i say what my street name is i say you know napa like wine country right Yes. So this venue had plenty of space. It had on-site security already ready to go. And the stage was already in place. So four days prior to the event, they announced the venue. But you could tell from the start that the planning was extremely last minute. You imagine now buying tickets to a show like I'll buy things for months out in advance, right? I was just going to say, like, we don't have social media at this point. How did they find out? I know. Rotary how do you announce landlines? the changes also? Because yeah. the menu changes after yes. this point. So how do you, like how many people that expected yeah. to go to the concert at Sears Point showed up that day and didn't know? Word of mouth. It's crazy. That's all you could rely on. Mm-hmm. So only two days prior to the show, the site's owners asked for a $100,000 fee and also distribution rights to any film made from the concert. Great last minute push for that. Right? And they're like, we know that you're doing this last minute, so we can just ask for more. Absolutely. They probably figured that everybody would just say yes because well, they, probably just they don't have time to find another venue. There's nowhere else to go. But what they didn't know was that Mick Jagger said he was unwilling to split any of the film's profits. So the organizers began searching for another venue. But again, I don't know how much this is of Mick Jagger or if it's just people throwing his name around. A lot is pinned on Mick Jagger personally. It's kind of funny. And I mean, maybe. He may have said that, but... Yeah, I don't know that I put it all on Mick Jagger's shoulders. But somehow the decision was made. Yes. Whoever was involved was like, yeah, we shouldn't split this money. That's a hefty fee. Let's find somewhere else. So they began searching for another venue and they found Altamont Speedway. Which was this really like desolate, remote location. It had a bunch of wrecked cars on the property. There were tires everywhere, oil stains, broken glass. Like it was really a mess. Sounds like the perfect place to have a bunch of people who are probably barefoot. Right. Standing around. Bunch of hippies just fucking on blankets on top of broken glass, basically. So all the other things that Sears Point had... Altamont didn't have as well. There was no security there that was already in place. There was no stage that existed. They were just foregoing all of those things. This was a ground up show. At this point, the organizers for the event were really desperate. And the owner of Altamont Speedway, Dick Carter, didn't want any money. All he wanted out of the whole thing was publicity. So it was a perfect match for them. So only 20 hours prior to the show they began preparing to set up the show at Altamont. It was so last minute, the change. And in the rush to put things together, 
they didn't organize things like enough food, enough water, restroom facilities, anything like that. Basically, the mentality of everyone organizing the show was kind of this laid back hippie vibe to a fault. And the organizers thought things would just kind of work themselves out. That's insane. Absolutely insane. Looking Hundreds back. of thousands of people. Yes. You're just like, eh, I'll work it out. It's one thing to just be like, hey, I'm having 10 people over. I'll just like get a little bit of food. Things will kind of work out. People will help out. They'll eat before they come to them. But hundreds of thousands at this place with a bunch of broken glass and trash everywhere. Right. (laughs) And no stage. So anyway, when they're planning all of this, in addition to not really having enough water or any of these things that could really lead to total disaster, they also had no evacuation plan and no medical emergency prep. Medical care, like tents, were set up really hastily with only about eight doctors and four psychiatric doctors that were there for bad trips. It's just not enough. No, you at need all. a huge team of people just for for hundreds of thousands acid of trips audience that members that are going horribly wrong alone. Mm-hmm. My God. Luckily, the Red Cross got news of the show, and even though the organizers hadn't even contacted them and tried to set up anything, the Red Cross prepared to send out supplies, and they sent staff out to the site, even though they weren't invited. The Rolling Stones themselves had a pretty bad aversion to police after some bad experiences at their previous shows. Nothing to do with the Rolling Stones themselves. No. The cops are bad. None of their behavior... (laughs) Sure. Yeah. But throughout their entire tour, they'd basically been adamant that no uniformed police would be allowed to attend any of their shows or provide security for any of their sort of travels. This show would be no exception to them. So they started looking at some alternative options for security at the Altamont show. And you can't just go online and Google, you know, Altamont nearby security right? team. It's just weird to me. How did they put all this together in like 18 hours? I mean, that could be said for a lot of things where I'm just like, how did life work in the 60s? Right? There's no Craigslist. I can't find just these random services and goods that I need out of nowhere. I can't look at my phone to see what the weather's going to be. (laughs) Right? I don't know what to wear. (laughs) What am I going to do? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like they were just kind of looking for some sort of security, but they had really nowhere to go off of at this point. So they're looking to their friends for some suggestions or local venues and stuff like that. But one of the bands, The Grateful Dead, had suggested to them that they use some people that provided security for them. They stepped up and said, we will help you find security for the event. And they volunteered the Hells Angels as security because they had used them previously Their manager, Rock Scully, told the Rolling Stones that they were, quote, really righteous dudes who carry themselves with honor and dignity. I think that Rock Scully maybe has an agenda here. And I love really righteous dudes. Mm -hmm. Honor and dignity, which is not really what I'd say about the Hells Angels, personally. I don't think a Hells Angel would claim that themselves. Yeah. Honor and dignity. Fuck that. (laughs) We're about snitches get stitches and, you know, human trafficking and meth. Right. I mean. Yeah, I don't know. The Hells Angels, they'd been founded in 1948 and they'd been relatively unknown for many years. But by this point in the 60s, they'd become pretty friendly with prominent figures in that San Francisco scene that they were getting the bands from. So they had made friends with counterculture icons like Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, Allen Ginsberg, Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead, like we said, and Timothy Leary. It makes sense how they all got to know each other, though, because they're all, you know, in buses and on bikes just going Mm -hmm. up and down the California coast, you know, dropping acid and listening to music. And so I see how, you know, they're all connected. It's all just San Francisco based area, you know. Hells Angels are up in Hollister, just going up and down the coast, down to L.A. Human trafficking. <laughs> like, right. Who knows what the hell's going on at this point? I mean, it's still early. Yeah. The Hells Angels were thrust into the spotlight just a few years prior to Altamont because Hunter S. Thompson had written his book, 
Hell's Angels, The Strange and Terrible Saga of the Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs. This book is nuts. And if you're ever just like wanting to see the world in a different time mm-hmm. and what you're allowed to say. Yeah. And it's kind of a slice of life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is what he had just put in this book. This is what he had seen. Crazy. So the Hells Angels, after the release of this book, became pretty well known as a one percenter outlaw organization, and they were considered to be an organized crime syndicate by the U.S. Department of Justice. Like I said, we won't go too far into patches and like biker stuff, but it is important to note that the title of one percenter quote comes from the saying that one percent of troublemakers give a bad name to 99 percent of bikers. There's also a thing that you can only wear the one percenter patch if you've committed murder for the club or, you know, there's certain it's all of it. There's just these little patches you can yeah. put on. It's like when you are a Girl Scout and you go to the service unit and you're like, oh, that patch is cute. I'm going to put it here. You know, it's it's the same shit. It really made me laugh when I thought about. But a lot of them are earned just like Girl Scouts. Oh, it's the but same. But it's earned for horrific things. If they attend an event, they get a patch. Yeah, I shouldn't say it's all horrific things, but it, but some of it is criminal. And, you know, oh, it's, it's just an organization where we can get together and have mm-hmm. charity rallies. It's a social thing. Social event. So the angels motto is angels forever, forever angels, which sounds really lame, but I bet so many people have that tattooed on them, right? Yeah. And also the capitals AFFA. Right. And that's it. Like all these gangs like banditos forever, forever banditos and they'll be BFFB. You know, it's just when you really look at it, it's funny. Their other motto is when we do right, nobody remembers. When we do wrong, nobody forgets. I feel like that's most people right i feel like that but uh, you know i think that's kind of like a victimy way to look at it like of no course. people are gonna remember you remember you by what you do that's sure. your actions this you know true. if it's overwhelmingly bad people are gonna say bad things about you sorry bro that's the way it works for this all of true. us it's this not that true. just the hell's angels So some of the more unsavory activities that the gang was involved in included drug dealing, trafficking, stolen goods, extortion, and prostitution. Yeah, and this is where the traveling up and down the coast in packs of, you know, anywhere from like 30 to 100 of these people really helped. Its members have asserted that they're only a group of motorcycle enthusiasts who basically just joined the club to ride motorcycles together, organize these social events like road trips and fundraisers and parties, and attend motorcycle rallies together. Hell's Angels have often explained that any crimes committed by their members only represent the actions of the individuals and not the club as a whole. Is that also... What I believe like the mafia Mm -hmm. and the church Mm -hmm. and every everyone that does bad shit is just like, well, it was just that one person. Sure. It was just that one priest that attacked that boy. No, (laughs) it's not. It's it's always people that are just like claiming it's an outlier that are part of a larger group doing bad shit. Yeah. The club also claims that it's all inclusive and not racially segregated. But for many decades, there have been no black members of any Hell's Angels charter. The Angels themselves explain that this is a result of no black people seeking membership, not because they required the members to be white. It's just all these comments they make about this bullshit about, you know, oh, well, just it's not us as a whole. Bullshit. Yeah. It's just so stupid. Like, it's insulting. It really, it really is. It's like insulting to intelligence. Sonny Barger, who was one of the founding members of the Oakland Hells Angels chapter, said in a 2000 interview, quote, the club as a whole is not racist, but we probably have enough racist members that no black guy is going to get in. It's infuriating to just I had to put that in there because we just need to be clear about what we're dealing with going into this story. These are the people providing security for this event where people of all backgrounds are coming and they clearly are so racially motivated. It's gross. So that's why I wanted to point that out. It stings of how BYU didn't allow any black people, any, you know, real racial diversity until 1974, which is also the year that all of a sudden their football team became unstoppable. And I think it's bullshit. 
I don't like that. 1974? That's so crazy. It's gross. Right. And this is still going on in the Hells Wait. Angels. Yeah. No, absolutely. Nothing has changed. Right. They're just somehow these assholes that are so loud that we can hear them driving by on our microphones. Right. Every goddamn time. Somehow keep quiet about this. What? Fuck you. Well, back in the 60s, the local Hells Angels had basically thought of themselves as sort of this paramilitary organization who was trying to keep the Bay Area streets clean. Internally, it was pretty well known that keeping the streets clean meant keeping the streets white. Many Hells Angels members had records for beating up and assaulting people of color in the Bay Area. The people who organized Altamont were either unaware of these racial issues or simply just didn't care They're when they hired them. They're also doing this in like 12 hours. Right. So they probably, they were probably have time desperate to care. as well. But I don't know. The Grateful Dead basically told the Stones that the Hells Angels had guarded equipment for them at previous shows and provided some security at gigs and everything went well. So they decided to hire them. Sam Cutler, who was the tour manager for the Grateful Dead and the Rolling Stones, made the final decision to actually hire the Hells Angels to work security at Altamont. The Hells Angels agreed to work security in exchange for $500 worth of beer. And today that would be about $3,500 adjusted. It's a pretty good amount of beer. It's but a lot of beer. I don't think that's enough for every time I hear this. I still I don't think that's enough for the Hell's Angels. Really? I don't know. What is I'm that? not up on my beer. Is it like currency. 2020 packs? Well, 3,500. I guess it's important to note that I, I don't do drink that. beer. So, yeah, I don't know. But that seems like a lot to me. I'm just like three thousand dollars. What the fuck? To me. OK, that's a lot. Isn't it? You're right. Yes. Yes, I'll go with that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, yeah, <laughs> I'm not that's trying to like bully so you into my view. No, no, because I'm it just thinking right like now that when you say out loud that like, oh, thirty five hundred dollars in beer doesn't sound like a lot. When I'm just thinking like, if that were cases stacked high, they'd be taller than me, and I'm like, that's a lot of beer. It is. So I have to say now, that's a lot of beer because otherwise, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> it doesn't sound <laughs> it doesn't good. sound good at all. <laughs> but I I know what like a a like twenty packs stacked high and about a thousand looks like. And that is a lot of beer. It is a lot. But I still don't think it's enough for a crew of Hells Angels doing security. Yeah. For a show. That's all. Like, when I go to a show, like, Sailor Courtney's coming out. <laughs> and these are Hells Angels. Like, these guys are out drinking everybody. <laughs> and they've got to, you know, beat the shit out of some folks. So, yeah, they got to get fucked up, right? Yeah. I guess Got to so. be securing. To Fucking make things crazy. so secure. And the Grateful Dead are just so, like, usually really chill. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob Weir is like. One of just the most easygoing, chill guys. And they're just like, yeah, we vouch for the Hells Angels. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of see where, you know, it was just a really poor decision. It was a really, really bad And bad really planning because there was no planning. There was no other option, it seems like. Yeah. It was the only group they could think of, of just tough guys. Exactly. You know? And as even though I have a lot of trouble picturing chill ass grateful dead like bob weir jerry garcia hanging out with hell's angels they did it all the time jerry garcia was a hang around yes oh yeah so i mean the reality is they kind of spent some time with them they knew them they probably trusted them they didn't think it was a bad decision they were all probably they all knew each other too because it was all san francisco local shit mm -hmm. and they were just going up and down jam i mean yeah I think that the average layperson is just not aware of that reputation. I and agree. any of the people closer to them, like the Grateful Dead or whatever, I just feel like maybe it's irresponsible because they probably knew. That's yeah. the part that sticks out to me. Yeah. I just question that a little bit. I'm not bit. blaming the Grateful Dead, but... I, I am. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We're going to have to make a phone call, Dead and Company, later. <laughs> So since they were hired just a couple days before the show, basically the Hells Angels were coming into this completely unfamiliar place to deal with a crowd that was a hundred times larger than they'd ever dealt with, with no preparation. Yeah, I mean, garden equipment is not the same as That's the securing other thing. 100,000 people. It's one thing to look after an amp. It's another thing to exactly. ensure the security of hundreds of thousands of audience members. Yeah. 
that's the the jump where it's like that wasn't even a good decision anyway they were completely unprepared by the time they arrived they had no tactics in place and they were the only authority figures tasked with ensuring the safety of a hundred thousand people the only authority figures are the hell's angels right i mean let lawless just rampant insanity fucking blossom mayhem completely i love that by the way just mayhem mayhem that's what it is so the day before the show on December 5th, 1969, a small team of people arrived to set up this tiny four foot high stage and a lighting system, which again, we've got only Hell's Angels and a tiny stage. So the band is right there with the audience. The audience is like 30 feet from Mick Jagger. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you really think about the four feet high. Mm hmm. It's, it's really crazy. So the stage was extremely low, but the people that built it figured that since it was at the bottom of this kind of slope between these slight rolling hills, the audience would still be able to see the bands. It was probably a pretty cool setup because it does sound neat that it's like in a valley kind of thing. And you, right. could, you could be just laying on a blanket, tripping balls, watching down below, not even have to move. Just, uh, right. I am on the grass. I am on the grass. <laughs> I am grass. And you can just hear like, you know. Freaking womp, womp, under womp. my thumb and grooming shelter going and just absolutely loving this. Right. But it sounds great for a jazz festival with 300 yes. people. That yes. sounds fantastic. But the scale of people packed in like sardines yeah. is terrifying to me that there's that many people with this little yeah. tiny stage in the middle. So that night, during the construction, it became pretty clear that this show would have a much different tone than Woodstock. The night before, concert goers basically started to arrive early. They began partying, playing music, and getting high. And it wasn't long before people started getting a bit reckless and destroying the neighboring property. Well, they need something to do. Right. Just I mean, having shit. a good time. They got there early. Pre-game in. My dad has this thing that he always says. He has, like, I call him Davisms. Like, okay. he always uses the same phrases. And he says, good, clean, fun all the time. But it's constantly <laughs> followed by these stories of yes. horrific bullshit where it's just like, good, clean, fun. Like, putting you know. soap in a fountain and watching it explode. Sure. Like, good, clean, fun. Like... Feeding pigeons Alka-Seltzer, like really oh, gnarly shit, you know? This oh. is what it sounds like to me when my dad says that, is good, clean, fun. That's like what it is. Like destroying the neighbor's fence and, you know, yeah. fucking in the front lawn, you totally. know? Kid Stuff shit. like that. Kid shit. Just yeah. reckless kid bullshit. But Absolutely. <laughs> these neighbors, I'm sure, had zero notice because they're finding out 20 hours before the show, just like everybody else, that there's going to be a bunch of hippies on their property and all of a sudden, they're trying to go to sleep, and there's yeah. people with bonfires, yeah. playing music, getting high, partying. And this is like a relatively tiny, sleepy community in mm -hmm. NorCal. Like, up in that area, yeah. once you start driving, you know, up the one and stuff like that, you get up there, it's really tiny little towns. Yeah. And they're like, oh, wait, what? Did you hear, Mary? In 20 hours, 100,000 people are coming here. To party And the it police- up are not allowed. They're having good, clean fun. Tons of it. <laughs> so the neighbors, of course, with zero notice and all this stuff, they're just pretty upset when these concert goers start arriving at the night before. And they start tearing down their fences, starting fires and using the fences as firewood. They were getting high. A lot of people said that there were people having sex on their property. Just random stuff like that. Good, clean, to be fun. young again, right? <laughs> like Not just to be a kid, just sex on a prop. Just you know, hey, hey, there's this dirt field over here. Let's let's go. Come on, right? We got a dirt field. <laughs> so all through the night and into the morning hours, more and more people kept coming. And by seven thirty the next morning, the Altamont Speedway and all its surrounding properties were completely packed beyond capacity with over 300,000 people. This was three times as many as the organizers had anticipated. That's like, a, I mean, isn't Disneyland numbers, right? I mean, huge. It's gotta be. Astronomical. Huge. And again, 
they're underprepared even for 100,000. They didn't have enough water, food, bathroom, medical supplies for 100,000. Now you multiply that times three. The bathroom thing is horrifying. Oh, God. I mean, I can barely even like pee in a cup. and I mean, I can't even pee in my home sometimes. I was going to say, you can't pee in public. I wasn't going to throw you under the bus. No, no. (laughs) Drive it over because I've been this way forever. Right. I can't. I can't go to porta potty. Right. Like, so you imagine all these hippies are just kind of like I can't squatting everywhere, having sex on the property and just peeing on the ground after you're done. There's probably people fucking where someone just peed. Oh no, there are for sure. Just shit piles oh, everywhere. Oh God, the hepatitis. <laughs> that's just oh everywhere. the hepatitis. Oh the outbreak. <laughs> So one of the people that arrived that morning of December 6, 1969, was Meredith Curley Hunter Jr., who was an 18-year-old art student from Berkeley. Meredith was nicknamed Murdoch and described by his friends as a flashy dresser with a big afro. His mother, Alpha, had struggled with schizophrenia, so Meredith and his sister, Dixie, had to grow up pretty quickly and look after each other from a very young age. By all accounts, they were really mature and self-sufficient very early on. Meredith grew up to be six foot two. He was super confident, stylish, fashionable. Every account of him, all his friends describe him as this super fashionable, flashy guy. Yeah, he's got great clothes. He wore these really big brimmed hats, colorful jackets, and even wore nail polish on his fingers, which was pretty rare at the time. I thought the same. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it was awesome. Really cool. So people say that there was this kind of certain swagger to his walk, as if he was a lot more comfortable in his skin than the other teenage boys that struggled with their kind of angst and insecurity. He wasn't like that. I would bet that would make someone who's very insecure even more insecure right when you're standing next to someone who's just so like you know comfortable with themselves and you're just not yeah it's just you know and then you're in awe of this person and then when you talk about him later you're like he was so awesome he was so into him so confident and, uh, you know yeah interesting yeah every description of him i just think it's remarkable because yeah. everyone goes through this like super insecure teenage years i feel like everyone's questioning themselves and people say he was just that guy that was like yeah, yeah. this is me i'm meredith you yeah. know He was really comfortable with himself, which is awesome. Meredith liked music, but it's pretty important to point out that he wasn't this huge music fan. He was more into the hippie movement. He liked counterculture events and hanging out with like-minded people, young people and hippies, you know? Meredith had recently attended the Monterey Jazz Festival and really enjoyed these good vibes and meeting new people. So when he heard about the Rolling Stones show at Altamont, he got really excited to go. He didn't necessarily even like the Rolling Stones, but he thought it would be a really fun event to attend just because of all the fellow hippies. Yeah, it sounds like he just kind of goes from festival to festival Mm -hmm. and just kind of, you know, hangs out like. Which is totally cool. Yeah. He doesn't discriminate on his music taste. He's just like, oh, I'm into whatever. I just want to be there and be around the people, enjoy the music. Yeah. Anyway, so he'd just been going to a bunch of these shows. His protective sister, Dixie, was always pretty anxious when he attended rock concerts. She was worried about racial tensions, and she knew it meant that he was kind of in danger at these events. And Dixie always lectured him to be careful and be safe. Good big sister. And Meredith told Dixie, you know what happens to people who look like us. Meredith was receptive enough to his sister's concerns that he actually decided he was going to protect himself by taking a gun with him. Dixie responded by laughing because she saw her brother as someone who acted pretty tough, but it was all a facade. He was really gentle. He was really kind of this quiet, calm guy. Yeah. So she told her brother, I see you got a gun, but I bet you don't even have any bullets for it. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't even sound like he would have intention to use it. It's really more just like, okay, I'm going to travel. I'm going to be with my chick. Yeah. Something happens, you know, whatever. Protection. Protection. kind of. Yeah. It's going to be in the middle of nowhere. Altamont is not a city. really. Right. It's remote. Yeah. So I could see that. It's not the same as when we hear about these stories where these chicks bring guns with them. 
or you know it, it's different this yeah. seems to me more like you know protection mm-hmm. vibe it, nothing like nefarious right exactly dixie didn't even think much of it because she knew he was kind of bringing this weapon only to scare people off like any assholes that would be confrontational or wanted to just kind of pick on a black teenager at a rock show would be scared off just by him pulling a gun for sure. And that was seemed to be his motivation, and everybody knew it, including his sister. That sounds completely reasonable, too. Yeah. And Meredith told Dixie not to worry because he wouldn't have to use it because he was just, like, bringing it just in case. It makes me nervous that, you know, once you get drunk and you're high and stuff, like, shit happens and things right. change. That's probably where Dixie's coming from. Mm-hmm. More you than never just know. take care of yourself, protect yourself. I, you know, that makes sense. But don't act stupid with this gun. Because you know what happens. Be safe. The same shit we are talking about today. Right. It's the worst case scenario that she's warning him about. So Meredith called his girlfriend, who was a white teenager named Patty Bredehoft, and invited her to the show along with one other couple. Meredith pulled out all the stops for the event. He was pretty excited. He borrowed his mother's boyfriend's car, which was this fancy champagne beige 65 Mustang. And he dressed up in his favorite lime green suit with this black silk shirt and a broad brim tat. It sounds like a character. But it's not. It's just him. It's so awesome that he's just lime green suit. I mean, I, I would live in that closet and just wear it all it sounds so fun and it's real life this wasn't like some tv show right he's just out he's not playing dress up he's just being himself whatever the hell he wants it's awesome his girlfriend patty was decked out like a hippie in this suede mini skirt with a cream colored blouse and she also wore this white cable knit top that her mother had made her if you see the movie gimme shelter this cable knit sweater that's knitted is so awesome yeah it's they were both all decked out just crocheted like knit so well and it just fits her so per it's like the exact 60s blonde chick with Mm -hmm. her you know hippie vibe and all that it's it's great yeah when i was going through this and looking at pictures and stuff i was like this is basically their hippie prom is what it looked like to me exactly what it looked like yeah On the day of the show, Meredith and Patty arrived early and got pretty close to the stage. The Hells Angels stood directly in front of the stage and they parked several of their bikes in front of the stage. And the stage is only four feet tall. So like some of these bikes are as tall as the stage. Uh Poor planning. Oh, yeah. Idiots. Come on. I also read that the crowd arrived before the Hells Angels. They weren't even there when most people showed up. So by the time the show started, the Hells Angels had to like basically drive their bikes all the way through the crowd to the stage. There's video of them just drive with no care for Mm -hmm. anyone, just driving these things, flying through crowds of people and just pushing them out of the way so they can sit their fucking bikes in front of a stage where people you can't even see. And these are the authority figures. Yeah, these securing are the people the that if something happens, you need to complain to and yeah. they'll handle it. So they formed this kind of barrier between the audience and the bands with their bikes. When the audience members got too close or too rowdy, the angels would hit them with weighted pool cues and motorcycle chains. Ow. They just brought a bunch of janky ass weapons, they is came what it sounds like. To fuck shit up. I mean, there's. No rhyme or reason why you need, if someone gets too close, you need to whack them over the head with a motorcycle chain. It's very extreme. They clearly didn't come to be peaceful and be no. authority figures and be security. Like they came. Even for bikers, I mean. To be violent. I want to say, like, this is extreme. Absolutely. I've been reading about some extreme behavior with these bikers, <laughs> but like, this one is, you, you know. You are deep in the wormhole I'm of bikers so right, deep now. right now. Right <laughs> now. A- when I arrived today, you had Hell's Angels footage on with Spanish subtitles. I did I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I did have that. And then my, my Hunter Thompson book is sitting on the coffee table. I'm doing research. I'm in deep. I feel like you are the living embodiment of Charlie Day in the mailroom 100% of the time. Cigarette and clipboard and everything. Just always. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're always turned up to 11. Wide-eyed. <laughs> screaming. <laughs> With my clipboard. And Murder Dictionary has given you like a focus oh. to those things. So like you have bikers to focus on now, but you've I always, really that's your personality. I really have to like thank everyone 
this is my calling. <laughs> like I've been looking for a way to, to put all this into a funnel and put it into something. I can write, I can use this, I can research, and I can find things out about anyone ever. Like the Courtney yeah. Bureau of Investigation, the CBI is in effect. <laughs> and it's always been like, hey, Court, what's going on? Can you like look into this for me? Done. Yep, My I got whole you. Life. Yeah, so it's really fun for me to be able to share all this knowledge and just like get it out <laughs> and know that there's like-minded people. Yeah, and it's a topic that, you know, it's, it's touchy. You, people don't want to hear about this. The no. memes of, you know, me at a, at a party and you're just by yourself with a Halloween mask on. It's real life, absolutely real life. And so when we met, I will never forget, it was we we're talking about something and all of a sudden I said, oh, you mean like Mia Zapata from the Gits? And you just turn, huh? How do you know about that? <laughs> How do you know about that? And that was done. That yep. was it. Off and running. <laughs> Can't stop. So I'm really glad to be able to use all this Now you have knowledge. a focus. Yeah, it's all focused on something. And every couple weeks, it's different. You know a whole bunch about bikers. That's the Next best week, part. it'll be something different. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and I already, usually I have like a little bit of knowledge, but then when you do the research and you just go down these rabbit holes. Yeah. Like bikers. So much deeper. Dude. Yeah. Bikers is is a good one. Yeah. So as the day went on, the Hells Angels and the crowd both got way more drunk and high, and the mood became pretty tense. So at some point, the bikers began hurling beer cans into the crowd, and everyone became pretty aggressive. Now, why are, are I'm imagining they're full cans of beer because that hurts if they hit you, yes. right? Because you're not throwing empty cans of beer. Why are you wasting all this beer that you got? <laughs> because they have $3,500 worth of beer, Courtney. And it's a lot of beer. That's, that's right. We have to remember. Beer. Courtney, that's a lot of beer. Plenty. Courtney, that's a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. So during Santana's set, the angels began bashing a couple naked hippies in the crowd, and a 24-year-old photographer named John Young moved closer to kind of take pictures of what was going on. And Santana's such a cool, chill, just chill, jam band. lean back and just let it wash over you. Mm -hmm. Why are we so aggro? Yeah, this whole event is kind of like it, that. It's strange because it really is set up to be like a chill relax lay on the grass listen to some music mm -hmm. and that's not at all what's happening at all i'm sure there's more like politically within the angels there always is yeah with these bikers there's politics that made it like where they came with such aggression because it is very strange it is it's not just like one of them it's mob mentality all is what of it them feels are like, like that all day long yeah so as this photographer, John Young, was moving closer to take pictures, one of the bikers turned to him and said, I want your film or you get hit. So John kept shooting and the angel lunged at him and smashed the camera into his face. Ouch. So John Young fell down and several more Hells Angels jumped on him and pounded him with pull cues. This was one of the first severe events of violence in the yeah. day. John rolled his body into this kind of protective ball and said that it felt like people were hitting him with a hammer and a broken bottle. I don't doubt his account of being hit with a bunch of different weapons. Everything's a weapon. Whatever they could grab. All the broken glass that's just on the ground yeah. at this place has the become a weapon. The venue itself is a fucking weapon. It, it's a mess. Yeah. So they finally let up and John made it to the Red Cross truck where he ended up needing 13 stitches in his head. So that knocks out at least one doctor right now that's busy. Check, seven doctors left, four psychiatrists, and that's it. Yeah, that's one of the things you have to kind of keep running in the back of your mind is this tally of how many people are headed to this tent there should <laughs> and how many doctors actually have free time to address yeah. new people walking in. There should be one doctor just for stitches. There's broken glass on the ground everywhere. By the time Santana finished their set, the mood was definitely really bad in the crowd and tensions were pretty high because this is kind of seemingly where the violence starts to kick off and get severe. It's building. So the MC Sam Cutler announced that a woman had given birth and clean sheets and diapers were needed. So within minutes, the stage was covered with donated supplies. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. What's that baby's name? I know. <laughs> That's what I, I should have found that out. Shit. I got to know. And by, oh, sorry, but okay. 
if a man said to me, like, we're going to this event, you're clearly about to pop. Nine months pregnant. And this is what we're going to do. She might have been on the back of a bike. I personally, I'm telling you right now, I'm nine months pregnant. Don't you ever call me and go, we're going to the fire festival. It's no. going to be great. You know? And we have no preparation for if I give birth. Right. In a fucking crowd of 300,000 people. It's just a different time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just like a spoiled little bitch. And I can't appreciate the beauty and the wonder of giving birth in the field with all these people surrounding us. Yeah, I think it's a personality thing because you and I are not the no. same person that is attending this event at nine months pregnant. No. You know what I mean? No. Not doing it. Just checking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Good. So the Jefferson Airplane took the stage next. And during their set, the Angels continued getting into arguments and altercations with various audience members. The guitarist, Marty Balin, tried to intervene and protect one of the black audience members that was actually being jumped by several Hells Angels. The bikers started throwing punches at Marty when he intervened, and they actually knocked him out. The rest of the members of Jefferson Airplane finished the second half of their song, Somebody to Love, while Marty was actually laying unconscious on the stage. What a visual. Crazy. And Grace is up there just unloading just killing it and mm -hmm. i mean they're all just fucked up there's hell's angels just everywhere you look and there's marty just laying on the goddamn yep. ground i mean it's bizarre it is a weird scene and watching no the footage. it's just yeah and everybody just kind of lets it all happen because the hell's angels are in charge and who's gonna go against these guys right they're beating the shit out of everyone right Anybody nobody that, could yeah. really stand up nobody could and the best a lot of the bands could do and you see several bands doing it they started making announcements yes so like Guitarist Paul Kantner began to make a speech, which attempted to defuse the situation now that one of their band members was unconscious. But a Hell's Angel intervened and grabbed the microphone from him. I think coming from Paul Kantner, because Jefferson Airplane, too, was a very, they were a San Francisco mm -hmm. group. They knew every, you know, they were they all, all knew each very other. tight, very friends. close. And coming from Paul Kantner, pleading to the hippies out there, like, calm down, chill out, yeah. please, everybody, probably would go a lot further than coming from British McJagger right. later. So I feel like Paul, like Jefferson Airplane, they were really making an attempt. And when you watch the footage, too, you can see, like, they're trying to calm everybody down, and they just got beat to shit for trying yeah and paul Kantner and grace slick i believe are together at this point still by the way oh yeah in that whole drama yeah. love her so i don't know i mean it just seemed like that was the only line of defense that any of these band members or organizers had was just to make various announcements and you hear over and over again in this footage people are pleading with the audience pleading. to be calm yeah i mean just begging them and there's just nothing to calm they can down do, so that's all they can and nobody's listening right you know nobody's hearing it so when the hell's angel grabbed the microphone from paul the audience began to boo and then more hell's angels rushed the stage but tensions were cooled off eventually after a couple minutes and jefferson airplane finished their set it was a lot of that. Like, it would swell and swell and get crazy, and then it would kind of calm down, and okay, mm -hmm. we're going to be good. Let's just get the rest set, and then the other band that's next can deal with this bullshit. Right. It was like, just get the They were just the trying to make it through. Roll through. Roll through. Next band. Next band. Next up, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young took the stage, while several fights broke out between the Hells Angels and various audience members. In addition to attacking various spectators, one of the Hells Angels repeatedly stabbed Stephen Still's leg with a sharpened bicycle spoke. So basically, every time Stephen Stills would step forward to get to his microphone and do some singing, this biker was just poking him over and over again. What is... Like, you're just really fucked up at that point, right? Totally insane. Because he's performing for you. Right. He's one of the band members. Yeah. I just, it's unreal. It By is the time so he strange. left the stage, Stephen Stills had blood soaking through his pant leg. I mean, that's not like, oh, I got you once, I got you twice. No, what? he's like, must have been completely fucked up and not even thinking and just kind of sharpened bicycle someone. spoke. Check on that list. Right. For shitty <laughs> Janky weapons. weapons. Yeah. So at the end of the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young set, several stretchers were sent into the audience and multiple injured people were carried out on stretchers to the Red Cross area. It's funny because it sounds like during the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young set, shit went crazy. 
So after several people were carried to the Red Cross area, volunteer medics started treating a ton of injured people. They were completely overwhelmed with people needing help by the time Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young finished. Thank God for these people. Yes, that showed up completely yeah. uninvited, just getting wind of the show. Yeah. They were pretty used to treating bad trips and kind of cut feet from the hippies at the show. But in addition to higher numbers of these incidents happening, they also treated dozens of lacerations, skull fractures, and injuries from the fights with Hells Angels, which they weren't really used to. I mean, skull fractures? Right. Maybe Multiple. shaped like a weighted pool cue? They also had an overwhelming number of bad trips at this fest. So many that they actually ran out of Thorazine. Wow. The volunteers recalled that there were many people who had bad trips on good acid, which seemed to be brought on by the tensions of all the violence around them. So a lot of other festivals, they could actually find the source where, oh, a bunch of people got bad acid, but that didn't seem to be the case here. There was actually a bunch of people tripping on good acid that would normally be a good experience, but because of all the violence and tension around them, they had really bad trips and had to t go to the medical tent. So much of that's environmental? Yes. That, I mean, you could be perfectly fine and then you'd look to your right and someone's head is exploding, being hit by a chain. Right. And now you're in a bad spot now. Absolutely. And you're just seeing their head and the, 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 the colors and the this. And, and like, it, that'll take you somewhere quick. That's a nightmare to be Horrible. having this bad trip and there's actual violence and gore just happening right in front of you i didn't even really think about it until like right now mm -hmm. and then they ran out of thorazine those four psychiatrists were just injecting yeah ah, their thumbs were sore so by the time that crosby stills nash and young finished their set the red cross facilities were completely packed with people needing medical attention there were no free you know doctors nurses to help anyone else that was coming in in addition to the severely injured people that were pulled out of the crowd, many other people that were close to the stage at the end of that set decided to leave between bands. And at minimum, most of the people in the front actually backed up and they made room for other people because they're like, we're not staying near the Hells Angels. We're moving to the back. Sounds like a wave pool is what I envisioned. It seemed like, I mean, people were saying that just a yeah. mass exodus of people were happening. For every 10,000 that walk away, 10,000 more came forward. Exactly. So as soon as they were safely away from the Hells Angels, they were replaced by other people. Because at this point, everyone knew that the Rolling Stones were coming up next. So the crowd that left, completely replaced by a new crowd of people. The Rolling Stones arrived by helicopter, and as Mick Jagger headed towards the stage, a random audience member blocked his path. He yelled, fuck you, Mick Jagger, I hate you, and punched him in the face. <laughs> I feel like there's so many signs of bad shit for Red this flag. entire event. Red flag. Just turn around and go home. Cancel and The everything. Hells Angels attitude is just pervasive and affecting all the concert goers now too. Yes. Everyone's so agitated and worked everybody up. Everybody is. So when he got punched, Mick fell to the ground and had to be helped up, but he didn't really sustain severe injuries, so they just went on with the show. By the time that the Stones took the stage, tensions were extremely high and Dozens of garbage fires were raging in the audience. Early on in their set, Denise Jukes from a local San Francisco rock band, The Ace of Cups, was hit in the head with a beer bottle. Denise was also six months pregnant at the time, and she had to be rushed out of the crowd to get emergency surgery because there was actually a piece of her skull that had been broken above her left eye. That's insane. It's unreal. I mean, they are they are beating on a pregnant woman with pool cues. Is and what's I've happening. I've never understood why people attack the performers. I've well, never. She's in the crowd, so they don't know. Oh, because everyone's waiting for for Rolling Stones to come up next. So she was one of the people that rushed to the front as uh -huh. everybody else left. Either way, this sucks. 
Lead singer Mick Jagger said to the audience, just cool down in the front there. Don't push around. Again, over and over pleading with people to be calm. All over that video, uh, the movies and the videos and stuff of this. It's just Mick Jagger pleading with everybody Mm -hmm. and just looking horrified. Just looking around like, Even as how do I get out of here? Singing, he looks almost confused. Yeah. Like he just can't comprehend the kind of violence that's going on and how to fix it. Everywhere he's like out of the corner, everywhere he's just seeing shit explode right in front of him. Like mm-hmm. so many fights at once that you can see him just he can't even take it all in. Right. As he's looking out from the stage, there's mm-hmm. nothing but garbage fires. Yeah. Janky weapons being thrown at innocent people. It's just an unreal scene. And the Hells Angels, when you watch it too, like they just get up on the stage, stand in front of them, walk around. Like they're just all over the place. So at the same time, I mean, there's just chaos going on. And it's only four foot high. Yes. There's probably as many Hells Angels on the stage at any given time as there are band members. Definitely. Yeah. There's they're always climbing up and down and attacking the audience from the stage. Within a minute of starting their third song, Sympathy for the Devil, a fight broke out right in front of the stage. The band pleaded with the audience again to calm down and then went into another song, Under My Thumb. At this point, during Under My Thumb, the angels seemed to shift their attention to 18-year-old Meredith Hunter that we talked about earlier. It's not exactly clear how the conflict began between Meredith and the Hells Angels, But in my mind, it seems impossible to rule out racial motivations because of the angel's history and the fact that Meredith was black and had a white girlfriend. There was some speculation that the Hells Angels had targeted Meredith because he was being kind of belligerent and was loaded. But there's conflicting reports of whether he was actually out of control or just kind of riled up because of the violence, like many of the other audience members. Yeah, he doesn't when you you see video and stuff, too, you know, and he doesn't seem more out of control than anybody else. No, but he is affected by his environment. What's going on? Yeah. And that first fight that starts during um, Sympathy for the Devil is right nearby. And it's almost like he sees that and that's going on. And then they just all of a sudden focus on him. And I think he's like reacting that he just saw this crazy ass fight. And then it's like, oh shit, now they're coming for me. Yeah. So of course he's on the defensive. Right. And but you no can more, feel the air vibrating. No more agitated than anybody no, else. Not at all. Yeah. I, it doesn't seem to me. The Grateful Dead manager, Rock Scully, noticed him in the crowd and later said, I saw what he was looking at. He was crazy, he was on drugs, and that he had murderous intent. There was no doubt in my mind that he intended to do terrible harm to Mick or somebody in the Rolling Stones or somebody else on that stage. Great damage control, asshole. That's the thing. You got to point out that that quote is coming from a person that's trying to like downplay everything and blame Meredith Hunter. And I think it's I think it's the the managers. Grateful Dead manager also was the Rolling Stones manager. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, this guy's fucked. Right. From all angles. Yeah, so he's just trying to save his own ass. Then, you know, there's other people that witnessed the same thing that we were seeing in the footage, saying that he looked kind of pretty normal. Everything seemed fine. Yeah, the words that they used were pretty straight. That's what the audience member said that was quoted. But he was just agitated like everybody else because of the violence. It wasn't that he was out of control more so than anybody else. The actual altercation itself kicked off when Meredith climbed on top of a speaker to get a better view of the band. One of the Hells Angels grabbed his ear and his hair and then pulled him down off the speaker and threw him to the ground. It's bullshit. He definitely was targeted. Everybody climbs on the speaker to get a bigger, better view of the band. He wasn't the only person. No. He was definitely picked out amongst other people. Yeah. So Meredith stood up from being thrown to the ground and the biker was laughing at him as he tried to grab his arm and his hand and attack him again. So Meredith's girlfriend, Patty, jumped in and she started pleading with him and tearfully begging him to calm down and move further back into the crowd with her. She was trying to get Meredith to leave, but he ignored her. Meredith was able to pull away from the biker, but then the angel grabbed his head and punched him in the mouth. 
At some point during the altercation, Meredith pulled out the gun that he had and pointed it up in the air. And it's most likely that he did this, like we discussed earlier, because he thought that any attacker would stop when they saw a weapon. It looks very last ditch effort too. When yes. you see the video, it it's is a frantic. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's not like a I'm in control and I got a gun. No, it's a Hail Mary move. It's I a, mean Oh, I'm way in over my head. But of course, the Hells Angels are not scared off by this shit. They're the wrong person to pull that move with, you yeah, know? It's true. And the biker was unfazed and he just didn't care about the gun and kept going after him. So Meredith ran away from the stage in the opposite direction while the biker chased him back into the crowd. At this point, four other Hells Angels rushed in and jumped him. His girlfriend, Patty, started pulling on various Hells Angels jackets to kind of stop them and pull them off Meredith. But these bikers just threw her off and pushed her away. Like a rag doll. A 21-year-old Hells Angel named Alan Passaro grabbed the gun from Meredith while pulling a knife and stabbing him. Even though the weapon was no longer a threat at this point, the bikers kept beating him. So most professional security companies would subdue the attacker, possibly handcuff them, and escort them away. You might get hit in the mouth. Like, right. you know, eh, bleh, whatever. And then they just control and remove. Diffuse the situation. If you try to steal at a store, they can't touch you. Right. But of course, we're dealing with Hells Angels. They oh, yeah. don't have any sort of oh, that's right. rules like that. One so- percenter outlaw biker gang. <laughs> MC. <laughs> So their only method of crowd control was violence, as we've seen this whole day. And they were just jumping Meredith severely. As the bikers kept beating him, Alan Pissarro stabbed him a few more times. There was a total of five stab wounds, we find out later. Oh, God. And like I said, I mean, at this point, there's no danger. The gun has been taken. They're just continuing to beat this person for the sake of doing it. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. It's like bloodlust. So one of the bikers grabbed onto both of Meredith's shoulders and started repeatedly kicking him in the face. Meredith fell down onto his stomach as the bikers kicked him and continued to stomp him. Meredith pleaded with them and said, I wasn't going to shoot you. And a biker responded, Why did you have a gun? But before Meredith could even respond, another Hells Angel grabbed a trash can and smashed it over Meredith. They then began kicking his head in while other bikers continued to kick and stomp him. It just went on for a while. And like I said, I'm just pointing this out because he no longer has a gun. He's no longer a threat. He is subdued and they're continuing to attack him. Yeah, just walking on him. I hate going through the details and and just keep saying it, but it, it just is important to point out he's not a threat and they just kept going. Yeah. The biker who actually started the whole fight by throwing him down from the speaker actually stood on Meredith's head for like a minute and then walked off as everything seemed to calm down. As the Hells Angels all stopped, various audience members kind of got closer and appeared to attempt to help Meredith. But the bikers yelled at them, don't touch him. He's going to die anyway. Let him die. He's going to die. Wow. It's one thing to, you know, attack and, you know, murder someone, right? Because he's going to die. Let him die, right? But to keep people from helping him. They got caught up in the moment and completely went too crazy on this dude. But at the point where they're calming down and realizing the gravity of what they'd done. They're better off with him dead. They're still not letting people help him. No. His girlfriend, Patty, tried to get close to him, but the bikers told her he deserves whatever he gets. Poor Patty, too. You see her on that video and she is inconsolable. Just screaming and just trying to get help, trying to help him. And then just, I have to go with him. I have to go, you know, and it's heartbreaking. Oh, I have chills. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That one's hard. So finally, after a few minutes, a few audience members stepped in to check on Meredith and the bikers stopped obstructing them from helping. 
Meredith was unconscious and he had severe injuries to his head, back, and torso. One of the people helping recalls seeing multiple stab wounds and said, quote, there was a big hole on his spine, a big hole on his side, and a big hole in his temple. So a few people grabbed Meredith and carried him out of the crowd to get medical attention. At the same time, Mick Jagger announced that they needed a doctor and requested that anyone with medical training come help the injured man in the front. So Robert Hyatt, a medical resident at the Public Health Hospital in San Francisco, was the very first doctor to reach Meredith's side. The people helping were in the process of trying to carry Meredith onto the stage in hopes that basically he could get to safety quicker if they went to the stage. Makes sense. The Hells Angels, however, wouldn't let them through and kept blocking the Good Samaritans from getting him onto the stage. And they told people to basically go around, even though they were right in front of the stage. Go around. 300,000 people. Go around. Unreal. One of the people helping speculated that the bikers knew he was going to die in a matter of minutes and probably wanted Meredith to die so that he wouldn't be able to talk. That's what I think the whole time, too, with that mm-hmm. whole concept is he's better off dead because he theoretically could say that's the guy that did this to me and name them and all this shit right exactly. later. So if he's dead, the best witness is a dead witness. It seems to be a pretty probable motivation. They're one sure. percenters, Brianna. <laughs> yeah, I forget. I think they're regular people, but they're not. No, no. These are bikers. So the people helping actually turned around and had to go the other way. And it took the volunteers about 15 minutes to actually get through the crowd and into the Red Cross truck. 15 minutes is a long time. When it's life or death, it's a long fucking time. I mean, five minutes is a long time, especially when you have neurological shit going on and like internal bleeding. I mean... This is, I don't, this one really like gets me, nothing gets to me, right? This one, like, it makes me really like my heart hurts for him. Yes. For the whole story, situation, Patty, everybody, Dixie, his sister. Mm -hmm. It's just tragic, this whole thing. And every minute that's ticking by and these people are obstructing people that are helping from getting him medical attention. Go around. It breaks my heart. When he finally arrived at the Red Cross tent, they checked for a pulse and it was already super faint and he was pretty close to death by the time he got there. Since there was no emergency planning like we talked about before and they didn't really have any way to evacuate or get Meredith to the hospital, they were trying to come up with solutions to get him medical attention. So as we know from before, the Rolling Stones had arrived by helicopter And some of these people helping attempted to convince the pilot to fly Meredith to the hospital. Great idea. Yes, absolutely. I mean, thinking on our feet here. Right. He needed to be in the hospital within minutes of the attack. And people urged the pilot to get Meredith to the hospital before it was too late. But the helicopter was reserved for the Rolling Stones and wanted to be there for their departure. So the pilot refused to leave without authorization. Bullshit. Again, uh, just breaks my heart. Yeah. Makes me mad. Without being quickly airlifted to a hospital, Meredith really had no chance of surviving his injuries. So he actually died while waiting for the ambulance to arrive. He was pronounced dead at the site. Such a tragedy. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're watching. Again, give me shelter. You're watching this whole thing happen. And at one point, you know, there you can hear them talking amongst themselves about this guy. Like, well, we've got to have him to the hospital. We've got to do this. We got to. And somebody says, like, his heartbeat is no longer. Like the way they put, it, he's right. like, he has no heartbeat. And Patty in the background is just falling apart, crying. I have to go with him. I have to go with him. And it's just like ridiculousness of the whole thing. None of this had to happen. There's such mayhem and insanity happening that it seems like half the people are approaching this as though Meredith is still alive and the other half of the people know that he's already passed away. Yeah, I think a lot of them thought that he was just really hurt. It's it's really crazy because you see that he's already covered with a blanket yeah. like he's gone. And they're still talking about But they're about talking about yes. him as though he's still alive. Yeah. It's just 
to me, another sign of how unprepared everybody was because anybody who was actual paramedic, a professional would have handled this situation differently. Yeah. I With more dignity and, you know, yeah. just better preparedness. I didn't really think about that. until. But you're right. That like half these people that are around are still talking about getting him help. But mm-hmm. meanwhile, this guy on the right is covering him up. Right. Super fucked up. Yeah. So... That's true. I mean, it's I just keep forgetting one of about the that elements somehow. is that everybody there is completely loaded. They ran out of Thorazine. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Announcement. No more Thorazine. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. This is me, Mick Jagger. We're out of Thorazine. Yeah. It's just, it's heartbreaking, like you said. It's so, so terrible to watch and to know that so many things could have been organized better to avoid this whole thing happening. Yeah. This death was completely unnecessary and completely preventable. And so much negligence went into making it be so dangerous, you know? But you don't understand. We have to get this film out before Woodstock. Yeah. That's the part that I come back to where it's just yeah, the, the greed that made this happen. Oh, yeah. It's bad. You know, we're talking about the murder and the Hells Angels. But it's important to point out that three other people died that day. Mark Feger and Richard Savlov, both 22, had recently moved to Berkeley from New Jersey, and they were sitting around a campfire around midnight when this 1964 Plymouth sedan completely plowed into the group around the fire, and several people were injured, and Mark and Richard were killed. And this Plymouth just sped away, complete hit and run, and never was caught. They were just, I mean, it was lawless out there. And then the third death occurred when a man jumped into an irrigation canal and drowned because the waters were too strong and overpowered him. Bad trip. Right. I mean, there's (laughs) so many things that this day was so tragic because they were unprepared, you know? It's dangerous enough to have this many people, even with a fully prepared, trained security staff. It's dangerous to have a huge crowd of people. They really just gave hippies, like, quote unquote hippies, benefit of the doubt and that they'll just remain calm. Right. They can govern themselves <laughs> they pretty much. They can take care of themselves. <laughs> I, I That is really, and like, we won't really need security because they're just a bunch of hippies. Everybody's going to be chill. So right. the Hells Angels won't even really be doing anything. They'll just be a presence. It's right. Kind of. Maybe yeah. more how it was thought. Great idea, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This was not going to work out. Yeah, absolutely. I want to think, even in the face of knowing that there was some greed and bullshit motivating them to put this together, I do want to believe that they had good intentions. Wasn't there a parent around somewhere going, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> this is dangerous. Not a good idea. Hey, where's Mick. Dixie? I mean, Dixie was on it. She's like, you can't, you know, I mean, the older sister, like, where's this, where are all these people's older sisters? Right. Hmm. So the Grateful Dead were actually supposed to play after the Rolling Stones. But as we know, there's multiple people dead at this point. So they decided to completely close the show and end it after the Rolling Stones. It was clear to everybody involved that the situation was way too volatile and dangerous and it needed to be over and send everybody home. So the Rolling Stones retreated to their helicopter and left the venue immediately after leaving the stage. Before leaving, Keith Richards said that the Hells Angels were, quote, sick and I'm never going to have anything to do with them again. Mick Jagger added, I'd rather have the cops than deal with the bikers again. Heavy statement. Right. Very weighted. Yeah. That's a big one. Mick Jagger claimed to be severely affected and saddened by the incident, but people that saw him later that night told a different story. Mick had basically had his eye on Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas, and he arranged for her to come to his hotel room after the show. After leaving the stage, he was also seen making out with a super groupie named Miss Pamela. And while they were hooking up, he suggested that Pamela join him and Michelle Phillips for a threesome. But she declined. Very interesting. Yeah. I think that, I don't know, like, I believe that Mick Jagger was affected by this. I do too. And I know, you know, I don't have to point out that he was trying to hook up a threesome. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I don't have to. But at the same time, I think it's important 
to point out that I think it only really hit him well after the event. I agree completely. That's what I was thinking too. I think too. seeing it was affecting him and you can see it on his face yeah. when you watch the footage. However, he just kind of carried on with his life. Oh, that sucked. Well, and also then tried the totality to hook up. of it being that three other people were killed too. Right. And this kid that he saw get murdered that he didn't even know he was being murdered at the time. That's heavy. Yeah. And then, real, you know, the next day or whatever, he's probably told, you know, all of these other people died too. That's a lot. Way more than, oh, I saw this guy in a fight. Right. Because he might not have known that he was dead at that point. Yeah. I want yeah, to believe helicopter. that he didn't know. I do too. But the other part of me is just that this information started reaching other people around the time yeah. that he was trying to do this. So I don't know. I just, I want to be fair and sure. say that. I don't know if it really hit him until everybody else talked about how shitty it was. Everybody is, is, you know, takes shit on differently. So I don't know. Like, I don't want to believe that he knew when he was doing this. But the reality is that by about two o'clock in the morning, everybody knew that Meredith Hunter had passed away. And I believe that he knew when he was kind of carrying on his rock star bullshit. At 2.30 in the morning... The news had already gotten around and the telephone rang at Alpha Hunter's house. It was a family friend who was calling to give condolences about the terrible news that her son Meredith had passed away. The police had actually not yet contacted the Hunter family. And this was the way that they found out that Meredith died. Terrible. The day after the murder, Rolling Stones tour manager Sam Cutler went into full damage control mode and gave a radio interview where he said, quotes, If you're asking me to issue a general put down of the Hells Angels, which I imagine a lot of people would be too happy to do, I'm not prepared to do that. The Angels did as they saw best in a difficult situation. 50% of people will dig what they did, and 50% of people will not dig what they did. I don't need to get into any kind of positive, anti kind of thing. As far as I'm concerned, they were people who were here who tried to help in their own way. You know, some people didn't dig what they did, and I'm sorry. I didn't dig what a lot of people did yesterday. Yeah, you know, I didn't dig it. I just, you know, I didn't dig it. That drives me absolutely fucking crazy. That makes me so mad because he's basically just like, well, I, you know, everybody kind of fucked up. Everybody was kind of shitty. There were a lot of people loaded is basically what he was saying. Yeah. And to me, it's just like, no, you invited racist assholes to come provide security at your event and you're refusing to take responsibility for the fact that they killed a black man. That's the, the reality yeah. of what happened here. You invited a criminal enterprise? Yes. And like... I mean, you're going to get what you fucking get. You paid $500. <laughs> you paid $500 beer for this and you got what you paid for. Basically. You did. You did. Absolutely. You got what you paid for. So Meredith Hunter's funeral took place four days after the concert at Skyview Memorial Lawn. Only 30 people attended and partially it was because the funeral notice hadn't been published until Wednesday, which was the same day as the funeral. The family actually couldn't afford a gravestone, so Meredith's grave would remain unmarked for decades. In the days following the murder, the gun was recovered and turned over to police. Meredith Hunter's autopsy confirmed that he did actually have methamphetamine in his bloodstream at the time of his death. Although, like we discussed, many people said he was not out of control by any means. Shortly after Meredith's death, his mother, Alpha Mae Anderson, requested that Altamont Raceway be turned into a public park to prevent any more wrongful deaths. I highly doubt they were ever going to use it again for another concert after that or anything. Right. But I'm pretty sure they were scared off. Yeah, no, for sure. But of course, it's just good to like yeah. ensure that they're accountable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because no one's going to hold them accountable. Alameda County officials voted to allow the raceway to still host races, but they barred them from hosting any concerts, and they also restricted the number of attendees to 3,000. Crazy. Remember, 3, we're talking about 300,000 people were at Altamont for the concert. Is that math 297,000 extra people? Yes. Whoa. 
Good math there. Check that out. After Meredith's death, his brother Donald would sit out in the front yard day after day, staring into nothingness. And neighbors say that it was kind of like he was waiting for Meredith to return home. His mother, Altha, underwent weeks of electroshock therapy at a hospital in Berkeley. When she came home, she looked pale and hollow, and it seemed like a light in her had kind of been dimmed. She was never the same. His sister, Dixie, tried to stay motivated and move forward. By many accounts, Dixie was just this really responsible Sounds kind ambitious. of stand-up lady. Yeah. yeah. She went back to school, she studied fashion arts, and then she got her teaching certificate so she could turn her passion for children into a career. The Hells Angel that actually stabbed Meredith, Alan Fasaro, was arrested and charged with murder for Meredith Hunter's death. Meredith's sister Dixie said, I'm hoping that people will be held accountable. The wounds are still devastating to our family. It really did, like, devastate that whole family. Just it completely the changed line. them. Dixie was able to kind of stand on the, you know, rubble mm -hmm. and build something from it, but it just, all accounts, everybody was just really it's so destroyed sad. after that. And he was such a force. Mm -hmm. He was such a, you know, everybody talked about him like he was just a huge part of any community he's in, family, whatever. Right. So it probably was a huge loss. Yeah. Oh. So sad. She also explained that she wasn't interested in the trial because it wouldn't bring her any closure and it certainly wouldn't bring Meredith back. Dixie said that she firmly believed that a white man would not be convicted of killing a black man in America. So Allen hired a lawyer named George Walker, who was himself African-American, which was probably an attempt to diffuse the argument for racial motivation in this crime. This is the San Jose chapter doing their own damage control. Exactly. A hundred percent right here. Yep. And it's, it's disgust. This is gross. Yeah. As fuck to me too. George Walker argued that Allen was acting in self-defense of others, meaning that he wasn't afraid for his own safety, but instead was afraid that Meredith Hunter was going to hurt somebody else. Wouldn't that be like paranoia, though? Right. Oh, I think he's going to... He was going to hit me, so I hit him first. Right. I, what? It's bullshit, basically. People in the audience had given accounts to various press outlets and friends since the show about basically how the Hells Angels went way too far that day. However, all these witnesses refused to come forward and testify when it came to the court case because they didn't want to go against the Hells Angels because they were afraid of them. This is just down the line. Every biker, gang, club, writer, this is across the board. They do not talk. Right. They it's an are underlying afraid. theme that not only the bikers themselves, but everyone that witnesses the crimes yeah. is afraid to come forward. The witnesses are terrified and the bikers themselves have this code of honor. Yeah. And, you know, stitches and all this sh snitches get stitches. You know, <laughs> all of that shit applies here. And they follow that. Yeah. Again and again, you see it. During the 17 days of testimony, the jury was shown footage from the filmmakers, which we had described earlier, and it showed Meredith pulling the gun and being attacked by the bikers. After 12 hours of deliberation, Alan Pissarro was acquitted on the grounds of self-defense. When the verdict was read, Alan screamed and celebrated in the courtroom. There's so many like elements to this. Like there's racial, there's mm -hmm. no criminal, there's drugs. And, and on every line, it's just like, oh, God. And just the way that the trial ended was so disrespectful for this person that lost their life and this yeah. family that lost their son and their brother. I just, it's heartbreaking. And the, the kind of disrespect to celebrate at that verdict is unreal to me the other thing too is we ourselves with our eyes have seen that footage that mm -hmm. the jury and every that they were shown and how they can see it and not convict someone is i mean it's a racially motivated thing right that's all this is yeah because there's no way there's no way we say this now about stuff too but i mean watch this shit and tell me i'm wrong Right. Change my mind. You know? 
No, it's clear to me seeing exactly the same thing yeah. that the jury saw that this was no longer a threat. And these bar- bikers murdered a young black man on purpose, very maliciously. And for a jury of people to acquit this person, it only makes sense to me that it was people that doubted him because he was a black man. I completely agree. With Even you in on the that. face of seeing the footage with their own eyes, they must have thought in their heads that he was more dangerous than he actually was. Yeah. Because you can actually see the situation being diffused and the bikers continued to beat him and stab him. Yep. So the only thing that makes sense is the jury just voting against a black man. Yeah. I I just, it breaks my heart. I've seen it. Yeah. (laughs) It's just, I don't understand. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking. And Meredith's family said that they weren't surprised by by the verdict. They knew that it was going to happen, which is just tragic. They did share that they were particularly hurt that the Rolling Stones and the other parties involved with the concert didn't apologize or offer condolences to their family. Even though the trial wasn't a surprise, they felt like people should at least say they're sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Stage manager Chip Monk was the only person to say sorry to Meredith's family. Good. Thank yeah. you, Chip. Yeah. Like, what a... Thank you. Chip's definitely the good guy. To like, have some sort of like, oh, hey, something bad happened. I should say sorry. Yeah. And he's not even like... He's the fucking stage manager guy. Yeah. He doesn't need to do that. Like, no. Yeah. Stand up guy. In this sense. I don't know Chip personally. With an entire story of tragedy upon yes. tragedy, it's just, I definitely wanted to point out that Chip was. But isn't one that of the also terrible? Like, at what le- we're like, oh, thank God. He said, he said sorry. Right. That's Which the is level, what you right? fucking should do. No shit. You know, like the fact that you have to point out the one guy right? that did the right thing is very sad. Dixie said that it felt like the people involved with Altamont had not acknowledged their family's huge loss. She's right. Yeah. Meredith's mother, Alpha, filed a $500,000 lawsuit against the band, their associates, the Hells Angels, and Altamont Speedway. Good. But after a while of fighting, she just eventually settled out of court for $10,000. Alpha said, it's just something that goes on in your mind. You just never forget it. $10,000. She was owed so much more just emotionally, you know. In the decades since Altamont, the event has basically been framed as the symbolic end of the hippie era and the 60s idealism. Altamont was seen as this turning point where people realized that peace and love were not enough and optimism could only get you so far. In 1995, Rolling Stone magazine asked Mick Jagger how he felt after finding out somebody had been killed at Altamont. Mick said, well, awful. I mean, just awful. You feel a responsibility. How could it all have been so silly and wrong? But I didn't think of these things that you guys thought of, you and the press, this great loss of innocence, this cathartic end of an era. I didn't think of any of that. That particular burden didn't weigh on my mind. It was more how awful it was to have had this experience and how awful it was for someone to get killed. I don't think that this age of idealism ended for him. So therefore, no. why, what are you talking about? I'm right. still fucking Michelle Phillips and Pamela DeBar and continuing to, to live my Mick Jagger life. Yeah. I don't understand what you mean. That's why I said, like, I don't <laughs> think any of this really hit him no. until other people pointed it out. It wasn't a thought that he had on his own. It's something that had to be put on him. Yeah. To say, hey, you guys are partially to blame for this. You yeah. Know? In 1985, Alan Pissarro drowned in Anderson Lake in southern Santa Clara County. Police said, quote, the death is kind of suspicious, although foul play was never confirmed or proved. On May 25th, 2005, the Alameda County Sheriff's Office announced that they would officially be closing the stabbing case of Meredith Hunter. 2005. Yep. And nobody has ever been held accountable for any of this. No. And they won't be. Never. Except for us 
passion judgment on folks. Right. But, you know. <laughs> Except for us being super judgy about these Hell's Angels, nobody really says anything. No. And like I said, it's something that even though I've known about Altamont, which feels like my entire life I've known that it happened, I didn't really know the full story of Same here. how all of these breakdowns led to this one person being so severely victimized. Yeah. And I hadn't seen Gimme Shelter in a while. So I really was, you know, in this biker mode. And so we're pulling up Gimme Shelter. Let's put it on the background. Let's watch a little bit, right? And Make sure those Spanish subtitles are on. Okay, that was all I could find. <laughs> I, was, I could only find one with Spanish subtitles, which is fine <laughs> because I watch English subtitles on everything I do, which people always are, what the hell is that about? I read. I read everything. So it's easier for me because maybe I'll miss what they say. Sometimes I right. can't hear something. It's, it's control issues. But so Gimme Shelter with Spanish subtitles is on YouTube. And I'm watching it, and all of a sudden, I'm just, like, looking through, like, who did this? And it's the Maisel brothers, who are the same ones who did Grey Gardens oh, with Big really? Edie and Little Edie in 76, because this is 1970, is right. when the movie's done. And they did Salesman, about the Bible Salesman. But this is, like, I didn't, I don't know how I got, hello, it's the same people. Totally That's some, space. definitely some Courtney knowledge that you have. Yeah. I would never see that and be like, oh, yeah, it's the Great Gardens So people. Great Gardens is also on YouTube, just so you know. You can watch that anytime. It's on my favorite. Does it have Spanish subtitles? I don't even care. Because um, I need that in my life. Not the one I've seen. But the Maisels, they're very good at just letting a camera show the story. Yeah. It just unfolds in front of you. And you watch it. And I love that they added the scenes where they're showing Mick Jagger the footage they have filmed mm -hmm. of the murder. And you can see him. He did not realize I yeah. watched a murder. Yeah. Until he's watching this and you see him going through it all. And it's just really interesting. Yeah. I just think that they did a particularly good job of letting the cameras capture everything as it happened. You yeah. know, and instead of trying to force a narrative or put in any sort of opinions, they were just taking footage. That was it. Yeah. You know, it kind of weighs on me that the filmmakers included footage of the attack on Meredith, because part of me thinks that it should be cut out, which is disrespectful to actually show the murder of someone happening on film. And the other part of me is like, well, is it just erasing that experience and what happened to him by cutting it out like I really kind of struggle with that I don't know in my own mind how comfortable I am with them showing it however I think to not show it is to not deny that this tragedy happened I think that I kind of go with you along that line I think more that this is like documenting history yeah at this point kind of and even if this happened, I always talk about Woodstock 99, what a shit show and just a terrible, yeah, that's true. terrible situation. It was kind of similar where you have these attitudes of aggression and, you know, it just all came together and exploded. And um, I think that if th we had the footage of this murder or whatever, we w that should be shown as well. Even if it was, you know, today, tomorrow, I kind of feel, you know, within reason, you're not going to make it rated G. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're responsible for what you put in your head. Yeah. Don't watch it. Right. You know? <sighs> yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I just struggle with, like, how the family feels yes. knowing that that was included. You know? Yeah, no. But also, uh, would they want his history and his impact on many people knowing about the story to be erased by taking it out of the film? I feel like it's kind of important to see. When you see it, it, it affects you. Yeah. And you should be affected. We talk about all the time. You know, we read about this stuff. But this, I think seeing it really like there's this other humanity. And you also put yourself in that situation of like, right. how do you bring a knife down on someone like that? Right. How do you how do you get there? And you get to see it. And I think it's kind of important. Yeah. And I think that the family was also pretty enlightened in the sense of like he was at a concert while black and you can see what this fucker did to him mm -hmm. and you're still not going to hold him accountable. Show it. Yeah. I just, I just try and put myself in the situation of other people and I don't want to watch my family member that happened to them. But if it's something that we can affect learn some sort of change, grow learn from yeah. something. Um, I hope that that's the case. Let's use it for good, not evil. Yeah. I, 
I'm kind but then of it's just trapped. kind of disheartening that we still have so many overwhelming racial tensions at this point, and it's fucking 2018. A lot of uh, Hell's Angels talk about how Altamont wasn't a tragedy. There's a lot of them that, you know, oh, we shouldn't have. Oh, that was bad. We regret that. But there are so many of them that, I mean, it's on fucking social media. Yeah, that just they post minimize shit about the Altamont whole bullshit. Be yeah. A fucking beacon in the light of their, in the dark, sorry, of their, you know, club. It's just disgusting. Yeah. So I have kind of. I don't know. I've learned a lot with bikers. I've always watched bikers and known all this, but this is a very deviant underbelly community. Yeah, this in whole a lot subculture of is And yes, there are crazy people that to dive just into. ride motorcycles. Yeah. They aren't trafficking humans and meth on the same bike. <laughs> right? It's just nuts. It is. Yeah, once you dive into it, it's just I'm really excited about so much. about the one next week or yeah. when we get to it. It's going to be nuts. I I, am I I don't know how we're even going to do it in one part. Right? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I, I got stuck halfway through and I went, I can't stop writing, but we're going to have to end this soon. <laughs> and I can't. I'm just still 10 pages down. I know. And so. that's how I felt with this story is I'm like, oh, I really, we've had some long episodes recently. I should make this a little bit shorter. And then when I started getting into it, I'm like, well, the same way with the footage. Like, I don't yeah. want to make it shorter and cut out anything that happened that day because this is truly what happened to Meredith Hunter. Yeah. And to cut out any of that and make it shorter because I just don't want to go over in time is bullshit. You know? I agree. So thank you for joining us for Bikers Altamont. This is probably the most famous biker story. So I think, it's good to start yeah. with this one as a jumping off point, right? You just say Altamont and the recognition's there. Yeah. yeah. So before we get out of here, we wanted to remind people again that you can find in our description and show notes some links to our social media if you want to follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And also if you want to read more about the story or watch the movies that we talked about, we'll put the links in there. And we wanted to thank the new people on our Patreon. So if you want to find the links to our Patreon for small merch items and bonus episodes, you can find those in the show notes, as well as the link to our Threadless if you want some merch. So we wanted to thank the people that are new on our Patreon. Thank you to Tamara, Brandy, Marsha, Ella, Sarah Emily, Amy, and Syrita to increase her pledge. Thanks, you guys. Thanks to everybody. I know, right? Thank you for listening. Yeah. And then we will see you next week for another biker story where Courtney is going to just get completely bug eye conspiracy theory on these patches. Big time. So, bottom rockers, <laughs> property of all of it. 1%. Dude. <laughs> I just keep thinking those look so hot. <laughs> every time like how are you in the sun riding to Sturgis in leather like that right we'll get there we'll get to all the cooling methods yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> next week so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time bye see ya hi I'm Brianna and I'm Courtney from Crime Screen Podcast where every week we talk about movies TV shows and docuseries based on true crimes we discuss all the bingeable and unforgettable true crime that we're all watching on our screens at home. Like Making a Murderer, Mommy Dead and Dearest, or Dear Zachary. So if you're like us and have the problem of scaring off people at parties with serial killer facts and true crime stories, or you just try to talk about whatever you watched and get horrified looks from coworkers and even hear exasperated significant other, then we are your new friends to discuss all the true crime with. Follow Crime Screen Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated. And subscribe to Crime Screen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to podcasts.
The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. The moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. Hi-o! This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.